Take five seconds to pause the video, read the question, and then we'll go through the answer. Okay, so 57-year-old obese female with a past medical history of type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, chronic hypertension, coronary artery bypass grafting. So they're really painting a pretty clear picture uh, right off the bat here. Uh, she's presenting to the emergency department for shortness of breath, denies any tobacco use, okay. When I see a chest x-ray like this, and then I see denies any tobacco use, I'm like, okay, well, we're not probably not talking about COPD, right? Because they're, they're telling you that for a reason. And she has a glass of wine on rare occasion. Okay, so we know the patient is not consuming large amounts of alcohol that potentially could be contributing to a heart failure. And in real life, you know, what people say sometimes is not always completely true, you know, in certain situations, but in board questions, when they tell you this is what the patient says, usually that's pretty accurate, okay? So based on this, we would assume that this patient is not drinking large amounts of alcohol. She says that she was having difficulty sleeping through the night because she is running to the bathroom every few hours to void. So she's urinating frequently. She reports throwing away her water pills last week due to frustration. So she was probably urinating frequently because she was on a diuretic, probably furosemide causing her to urinate more frequently. And this is actually a pretty common problem in real life. So she threw the pills away last week. So maybe she's volume overloaded now. Blood pressures, 164 over 88, uh, saturating 94% on two liters by of oxygen by nasal cannula. Physical exam reveals diffuse crackles bilaterally in the lung fields, All right? We can see some of that interstitial edema here. An S3 heart sound very consistent with that kind of that volume overload state. Two plus pitting edema in the bilateral lower extremities. Chest x-ray is shown here. Again, we're classically, you know, I don't really see any uh, pleural effusion here, right? We can see sharp costophrenic angles. Um, the heart is actually a little enlarged here. So usually the way that you can look for cardiomegaly is if this heart border takes up more than half of the distance between the two lung fields here. So if it takes up more than half of this distance, usually we'll call that cardiomegaly. And in this case, I think we can say that it does take up more than half. And so I'm just gonna write here, that's kind of you know, your cardiomegaly. So this is an enlarged heart, which is also very classic for heart failure. You might be saying, why is that? Well, remember, we have all this volume, we have all this blood sitting in the heart and we're having a problem getting it out of the heart. That's you know the backup of blood that we were talking about in the beginning of this video. And so that's why you have this cardiomegaly. EKG reveals a normal sinus rhythm with mild left ventricular hypertrophy. Thyroid stimulating hormone is in normal limits. So if there was any question about, you know, thyroid, hyperthyroidism causing high output heart failure, right? They're telling you the TSH is normal. BNP levels are significantly elevated. Patient had an echocardiogram performed three months earlier, revealing a left ejection fraction of 30%. So we didn't really talk about the numbers on this, um, but just to kind of keep this in mind, now that you know, hopefully you have an understanding of this, but if you have an ejection fraction less than, let's say 35 to 40%, somewhere in this range, you start to get into the systolic heart failure category. And sometimes they'll give you like a reference here, you know, reference greater than 40, 45 or something like that. But yeah, 30% is a pretty low ejection fraction. You know, I don't know that you necessarily completely need this to answer the question, um, but let's just go through which of the following findings are most consistent with this patient's presentation. All right, let's just go through this top down. So depressed pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So remember that the PCWP, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, is kind of a surrogate marker for the left atrial pressure. Okay, now, do you think this patient would have a low or high left atrial pressure given the fact, given the presentation? They probably would have a high left atrial pressure. Okay, the patient has a pretty low ejection fraction. Okay, they have cardiomegaly, they have edema in the lungs. Okay, the fact that the there's interstitial edema in the lungs tells you that that backup has already passed the left atrium. So the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure should be elevated. You might be saying, hold on, Dr. Revisor. Well, let me look at this for a second. You're telling me that the, the BNP level, the B-type natriuretic peptide, is way up, right? The BNP level is way up. And doesn't the BNP cause you to have vasodilation? Doesn't it cause naturesis? Wouldn't these things lead to a lower left atrial pressure? And the answer to that is they would lead to a lower left atrial pressure. But here's the problem. Remember, in heart failure, the RAS system always wins. The BNP is just trying to catch up to all of the problems that are going on in the heart. It's trying to compensate for this significant, significant volume overload. And it's not doing enough to get this patient out of the state. And we know that because we can see this chest X-ray showing us there's fluid in the lung, there's cardiomegaly, patient has peripheral edema, right? We have uh, diffuse crackles in the lungs, S3 heart sound, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
expensive. So the BNP is elevated to try to compensate for this, but even then it's not enough. So overall, there is going to be a decreased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So just keep that in mind. Same thing is true for B, depressed central venous pressure. Remember, this is kind of a, a surrogate marker again for your right atrial pressure. And we know that there's probably an elevated right atrial pressure because this patient has pitting edema in the lower extremities. So it looks like this is kind of already past the right side of the heart. For C, elevated cardiac index. So cardiac index is essentially looking at your cardiac output as it relates to your body surface area. Okay, so if the cardiac output goes up, the cardiac index usually is going to go up, right? So saying that an elevated cardiac index would imply that the patient has an elevated cardiac output. Knowing that the patient's last ejection fraction three months earlier was 30%, and it looks like they're in an acute heart failure exacerbation, you know, it would be hard to imagine that this patient has a pretty significantly elevated cardiac index. So probably not going to be the best answer, right? The lower ejection fraction is gonna be more consistent with a lower cardiac uh, output. Let's just skip to E here really quickly. Significantly decreased serum levels of vitamin B1. So remember, this would be kind of referring to that wet beriberi or thiamine deficiency. And this would be very classic in a patient, again, like I said, that's has, you know, kind of unusual diets, is very malnourished, only eating certain types of rice, or a patient that has chronic alcohol use. And really the only kind of indication to alcohol use that we have here is that she has a glass of wine on a rare occasion. There isn't really anything to completely suggest that this patient has, you know, this type of heart failure. It would seem unlikely given the presentation, especially because, like I said, it's usually a malnourished patient, not an obese female that isn't really drinking any alcohol. It doesn't fit the classic presentation. If they gave us some specific findings for B1 deficiency, like I talked about earlier, elevated transketolase activity after giving B1, then I can kind of see it. But here, it doesn't seem like that would be logical given this patient's presentation. There is a much better answer, that being D. So increased urinary potassium excretion. So again, if the patient previously was taking a water pill, so to speak, now we don't know exactly which water pill they're talking about, but most likely the patient probably had something like a diuretic, okay? Now the big common one would probably be furosemide. Now if they were taking furosemide, furosemide actually causes lower potassium levels. Okay, and we'll talk about this in the renal section, as opposed to most of the other heart failure medications, which actually cause the potassium level to go up. So this is one of the ones that actually would cause the potassium level to go down. Now, she was taking that before she stopped taking that. Okay, so that could potentially be the cause. But this answers right even more so because this patient is in an acute heart failure exacerbation. Okay, if the patient is in an acute heart failure exacerbation, we know this is largely because of the villains, the RAS system, and our sympathetics. Now, the RAS system in general is going to be causing very high levels of aldosterone release. These increased levels of aldosterone, remember, the two big things they're going to do, increase sodium reabsorption. So I'm going to have more sodium in the blood, and I'm going to have less potassium. I'm going to have increased potassium excretion. So I'm going to have less potassium in the blood. So again, patients in heart failure typically will have lower levels of potassium in the blood. Where is all that potassium going? It's getting excreted out in the urine because aldosterone is causing the sodium to come in in exchange for the potassium to go out. So we would expect this patient probably who's in an acute exacerbation to have increased urinary potassium excretion.